Le Chatelier's Principle. Here's the definition for Le Chatelier's Principle. When a change is imposed on a system at equilibrium, the position of the equilibrium will shift in a direction that tends to reduce the effect of the change. We will refer to the change in our discussion as a stress. So here you see the word change mentioned twice. Change will be simply referred to as a stress. And when we talk about shift, it means it's going to increase either the rate of the forward reaction or increase the rate of the reverse reaction. So there are three stresses that upset equilibrium, and we're going to discuss each one of these individually, but first I'm going to list them. The first stress that upsets equilibrium is a change in concentration. The second stress that upsets equilibrium is a change in temperature. And the third stress that upsets equilibrium is a change in pressure. So let's begin our discussion with looking at the effect of concentration. So suppose you have an equilibrium system established between four substances, A, B, C, and D. And the stress that is applied is an increase in A. So what happens is there's then A added to the system at equilibrium. So there's too much A. You have to get rid of A. So there's two options to get rid of A. You can increase the rate of the Ford reaction or the, you could increase the rate of the reverse reaction. Increasing the rate of the Ford would use up A and B, but increasing the rate of the reverse would make more A, so it would actually make the situation worse. So, when we look at this reaction and the stress is an increase in the concentration, what happens is a position of the equilibrium will move to decrease the concentration by A by reacting that with B and turning it into, into C and D. So, what we're going to talk about for each one of these stresses, we're also going to mention the word shift. So what we want to do is identify the stress, say which way it shifts, and then for the shift there will be three options, either right, left, or no change. Now for this, we said the stress is going to, to react more A with B, so that's going to increase the rate of the Ford reaction. We're also going to refer to the Ford reaction as going to the right. So the shift is going to be going to the right. And so what happens, we know that the amount of A was already increased, but when it shifts the right, B is going to be used up with all that extra A. So the amount of B will go down, and because we've increased that rate of the Ford, we're making more products of the Ford reaction. So the amount of C is going to go up, it's going to increase. And also, the amount of D is going to increase. So as we go through these problems, here are basically the three steps we'll do. You want to identify the stress, then say the shift, then look at each substance in the reaction and say if that amount's going to increase, decrease, or not change. And notice one thing that is going to be different is initially we're always going to write in the concentration of the stress. So A is going to be told to us and we'll just write that in initially. So let's do another one of these. So the important thing from this, I, I'd include another arrow, is we increase the rate of the four reaction, which is going to the right, and that's why we had so much more C and D, and, and that's why the amount of B went down. Here's another way to think about this, this situation with equilibrium and stresses with concentration. So let's say we have the same reaction with A and B going to C and D. And we know A and B are the reactants, C and D are the products. Well, if we think of a sort of an aquarium, we know water can shift in an aquarium. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say there's a barrier in the middle. And that barrier could be mesh, so water is able to flow freely from right to left and left to right. So the other thing I want to add is a bucket. Okay, let's say I have a bucket. And in this bucket, I can pour in A, I can take out A, I can pour in any of the reactants or products. So let's imagine you took this bucket and you went up the aquarium and you just took out a great amount of this water on this side, the A, for example. What's going to happen is it's going to shift to the left to make up for the A that was lost. So if you could think about the aquarium as an example and either pouring in substances on the reactant or the product side, or either removing substances from the reactant or the product side, that will help you think about which way it's going to shift. So let's do some more examples. So let's go back to the reaction we had a second ago. A plus B goes to C and D, but this time the stress is going to be removing A. So A was taken out. So we're going to go ahead and write that down. So we said we removed A. If the, if the fact is we have too little A, we need to make more A. So the only way, way to make more A is to increase the rate of the reverse reaction, which is going to the left. So the shift from this would be going to the left. So once again, we identify the stress, 
Next, we said which way the shift was. And now we want to go in and look at the reaction and identify what happens, happens to each substance besides the stress. So if it's shifted to the left, C and D are going to be used up at a greater rate. So those amounts will decrease. And then more B is going to be created. And so the amount of B is going to increase. Let's go on to look at the next stress of equilibrium. That would be temperature. Now for temperature, the first thing you have to know is the reaction endothermic or exothermic. Now we see here energy is actually written as part of the reaction and it's written as a product. So anytime it's written as a product, that, that tells us that the reaction is exothermic. You must know if the reaction is exothermic, uh, which means energy is given off, or it's endothermic, which, which means energy is absorbed. Now there's another way you could be told if a reaction is exothermic or endothermic. You could be told the delta H value. So for example, in this reaction, the delta H value is negative, so that means it's exothermic. So there's three ways you could be told about the reaction, the energy process. You could, you could have the energy written as part of the reaction. Here we see it's a product, so that's exothermic. You could be told in, this, in the question or the statement that it is exothermic or endothermic. Or they could also write the delta H value, and if it's a negative, that tells us that it's, a ne that it's an exothermic reaction. Let's look at an example with this. Let's say the stress was an increase in temperature. Now, if you think of energy as just another substance in the reaction, you can pretty much answer these the same way you do concentration. So if you think of energy as a product, if we increase temperature, what you're basically doing is you're adding energy. So you're basically putting energy into this side. So when you increase energy, what it's going to do is it's going to increase the rate of the reverse reaction because all this extra energy wants to be dissipated, so it goes opposite from the energy. So the shift from this would be left. When it shifts left, the amount of C and D is used up, so these two will go down, and the amount of B and A will go up. So there we go, B and A both went up. So let's look at another example. Let's say we have another reaction. This is nitrogen plus hydrogen forms ammonia. And this time they didn't put energy in the reaction, but they told us this time that the delta H was negative. Hopefully you remember a negative delta H means it's an exothermic reaction. So that means simply that that's this negative or the 92 kilojoules is given off as a product, or you just think of, you could write the number in there, or you just think their energy is right there as a product. In this situation, what would happen if the stress was a decrease in temperature? So this time, what you're basically doing is you're taking this energy and you're removing it from the reaction. Energy is removed, what that's going to do is you want to make up for that energy that's lost. To do that, you're going to, the, the rate of the Ford reaction is going to increase, which means the shift is going to go to the right. So Ford means right once again. When it shifts to the right, the amounts of nitrogen and the amounts of hydrogen will both decrease. But since it's shifting to the right and the Ford reaction is increasing at a faster rate than the reverse reaction, the amount of ammonia is going to increase. Now, an important thing to notice is that this, uh, this shift where when one reaction rate increases and the other decreases happens, and then at some point, equilibrium is reestablished. But initially, after that change, the shift means that, for example, in this one, Shift right means the right reaction, the forward reaction is going much faster, and the reverse reaction is still happening, it's just not going very fast. We've got one more stress here, and that's pressure. And pressure is a little bit different from temperature and concentration. And one important thing about pressure is that it only applies to reactions involving gases. So you need to look at the state of each substance in the reaction. As long as there is at least one substance as a gas, pressure can impact the direction or shift the reaction. So Here's what you need to remember about pressure. An increase in, in pressure favors a smaller number of moles. Similarly, a decrease in pressure favors a larger number of moles. Now, how do you remember this? Now, here's what I do is I think of a gas, for example, nitrogen dioxide or any gas, in a syringe. For example, in the first one, it should represent an increase in pressure because to make that gas smaller, you'd have to push down on that syringe. So when you push down the syringe, the gas actually gets smaller. But you see here, this is a smaller amount of gas. So increase in pressure favors a smaller number of moles. So we see here a smaller number of moles. So on the opposite side of that, we see this syringe is pulled up. So that would represent a decrease in pressure. So a decrease in pressure, we said, favors the larger number of moles. 
So just think about a syringe or maybe even a bicycle pump. So when you push down, you're increasing pressure, the gas gets smaller, that's what it favors. When you pull up, that's a decrease in pressure or a larger number of moles. Let's use this idea and try to answer a couple of questions. Okay, let's say we have the reaction we just talked about with nitrogen, hydrogen, for, forming ammonia. Now this is a great reaction because we see, first of all, we can do this because they're all gases, so pressure would impact this reaction. So this stress is an increase in pressure. Hopefully you remembered an increase in pressure favors a, think of a syringe pushing down, a smaller number of moles. Now, so what we need to do is go into the reaction and count the number of moles. If we go to the reactant side, we see there's an understood number one in front of a nitrogen. And in front of the hydrogen, there's a number three. So the number of moles on the reactant side would be a four. On the product side, there's only one substance, so the number of moles there would be two. What this means, an increase in pressure would favor the smaller number of moles, that would favor the two moles over the four moles, so it would go toward the two moles, so this reaction would shift right or forward. So what, you did, what we did is we counted the moles of reactant gas and the moles of product gas, and then we said it shifted right. So when it shifts right, next thing we want to do is go in and say what happens to each substance. When it shifts right, that forward reaction is increasing much, it's going much faster, reverse reaction is going much slower. And so what happens? Nitrogen, the amount of nitrogen goes down, the amount of hydrogen goes down, but the amount of ammonia increases. So you have a lot more ammonia in, in, produced when you increase the pressure. Let's look at one more situation, and this will be our last one. Let's say another increase in pressure situation, but this one is going to be what would happen. Oh, what would happen if the, the number of moles of reactant product gas were the same? This means there would simply be no shift. So look for that if you ever see equal number of moles of gas on each side, it means there would be no shift. Now let's do one more reaction. And for this one, we're going to look at the reaction of solid calcium carbonate. When it's heated, it decomposes and produces calcium oxide, which is a solid, and carbon dioxide gas. Now, pressure actually impacts this. Even though we have two solids here, there is one gas. So at the presence of one gas means pressure will impact this reaction. So the stress, we're going to say, is an, a decrease in pressure. So we need to go back and count the number of moles of reactant gas and the number of moles of product gas. Now we see there's no gases in the reactants, so the number of moles of reactant gas is actually zero. And the number of moles of product gas, we see there's uh, just one CO2 is going to be one because the calcium oxide is solid. Increase in pressure favors, favors we want to see which way this would shift. This would shift to the right because decrease, decrease in pressure favors a larger number of moles. It's like you have a syringe you pull up on it, that's less pressure, and the larger number is the number one. So what would happen, now the amount of calcium carbonate would decrease, the amount of calcium oxide would increase, and then there would be more CO2 produced in the reaction, so that amount would increase. Let's look at sort of the example of that. This is our last one. This is the same reaction. Let's say we're going to do the opposite thing. We're going to increase the pressure. So here I've, you've got a visual. We've actually increased the pressure on this system. Remember we said increase in pressure favors the smaller number of moles. We said this was zero moles on the reactant side and only one mole on the product side. So if increase in pressure favors a smaller number of moles, think about which way is this, is this reaction will shift. It's going to shift to the left. So it's going to go toward the smaller number. And so you're going to see the reverse reaction increasing. So the shift for this is going to be left. When it shifts left, there will be more calcium carbonate in, uh, produced, more calcium oxide used up, and there will be less volume, a uh, smaller volume of the carbon dioxide gas. And you can sort of see this in an illustration because calcium carbonate is this solid. You see that amount has increased here, and then the calcium oxide has decreased. And you also, if you count the number of particles of CO2 that are present, that has all gone down as well. I love chemistry. I love chemistry. I love chemistry.